All right, so you guys just did your 13 colonies brochures and you basically were looking at how the Americas start to get permanently settled. Again, I've mentioned this several times, but you really have sort of four major power players in Europe that end up help settling the Americas, the British, the French, the Portuguese, and the Spanish. Um, but because this is U.S. history, we're going to be focusing on the British settlement of the Americas, specifically because we have a huge influence from British culture. We speak English. We end up modeling our, um, our government a little bit after theirs, so on and so forth. So once the 13 colonies officially get established, things are basically going great. You know, you have the British that, you know, rule over the 13 colonies. Again, when the 13 colonies get established, even though we look at them today as states, at the time, they were not states. They were controlled and ruled by the British. And for a really long time, the colonists were fine with that. They weren't looking for independence. They weren't looking to create their own country. But eventually, there is going to be some philosophical changes that end up taking place in the colonies. The first one that we're going to look at is the Great Awakening. So the Great Awakening was a spiritual revival that swept the colonies in the 1730s and 1740s. Really what we're going to be looking at is an emphasis on Christianity. Now oftentimes you hear that America got started, you know, because uh, people were looking for re religious freedom. That's half true, right? Again, when Columbus sails here in 1492, he starts this age of exploration. So when people were coming to the Americas, they certainly weren't doing so necessarily for religious freedom. They were really doing so because, again, they wanted land, a territory, and a new opportunity to make some money. Now, by the time you get to sort of the 1620s, there are going to be some groups of people that come to the Americas in search of religious freedom. Of course, the most famous group is going to be the Puritans and the landing on Plymouth Rock. So Christianity obviously plays a big role in American society. Most people would say that we are a Christian nation, even though we have religious freedom. Most people, if they identify with a religion, for the most part in the United States, it tends to be Christianity that people identify with. Whether or not you go with the umbrella of Christianity and Catholicism, again, it's kind of up to you and your beliefs. But is everyone a Christian? No. But again, if you're religious in the United States, chances are you believe in some type of Christian values. So when the Great Awakening happens, the idea was that we need to live like this very godly, purely life. That, you know, the only way that we're going to be good people is if we have good religious morals. A book that you guys probably should be reading this year, it depends on your teacher, um, is The Scarlet Letter. And really The Scarlet Letter is a reflection of this Great Awakening. And that, uh, you know, if you had like this red A, basically meant that you were like a sinner, an adulterer, and therefore you were a good godly person. And that's really what The Great Awakening about, was about, was making sure that people were living their best life, but they were living their life as close to the Bible and the Bible's teachings as possible. So don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, all those different types of things. The good morals that religion is supposed to teach us. And Jonathan Edwards, um, he really sort of captures this whole Great Awakening movement when he delivers this sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And basically what he tells the people, because um, again, it's the colonies at this time. We're not quite the United States. But he basically tells the colonists that the only way that you're ever going to go to heaven is if, again, you start living your best life. We're all sinners, we already know this, and the only way that your sins can be forgiven is for you to accept God and Jesus in your life, and if you don't do those things, you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn there. That was really sort of his idea. So religion, again, at this time was very rampant in the colonies, had a very heavy influence. I'm sure a lot of you guys, when doing your 13 colonies brochures, probably noticed that, especially if you had the New England region. Uh, but religion was, was huge in the colonies, definitely still big in America today. Um, I would say not as rampant as it was a few hundred years ago, but again, religion does play an important role. So even though sort of religion was really the focus in the Great Awakening, the colonists are going to start to be influenced by a movement that becomes known as the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was a cultural movement of intellectuals in the 18th century Europe. So remember, 18th century would be 1700s. If we were talking 19th century, we'd be talking the 1800s. So right now we're in the 21st century. That would be the 2000s. And in the United States, whose purpose was to reform society and advance knowledge through reason and logic. 
The best way to look at the Enlightenment periods is that the Enlightenment thinkers were moving away from religion and looking towards reason and logic. And this didn't mean that they hated religion or didn't believe in religion. A lot of the Enlightenment thinkers are basically under the belief that we should be tolerant of all religions. So whether people believe in a monotheistic religion, meaning one God, so whether that would be Christianity, Islam, or Judaism, or whether people believed in you know, religions that believed in multiple gods, or, you know, you're a Wiccan and you believe in, like, witchcraft and things like that, that people, no matter what religious beliefs they choose to have, should be tolerant of those of those religious beliefs. But a lot of these Enlightenment thinkers, a lot of them were what we called a deist. And a deist basically means that they believe God created the world and then left it up for humans to decide what it is that they're going to do with it. So they didn't believe in ideas of, like, divine intervention or that if you prayed to God, like he was going to make things in your life better. Or if somebody was sick, they were suddenly going to heal. They basically felt that like God left the world to humans and that humans needed to decide what to do with this world. And that's where that reason and logic is going to come in. So again, didn't mean that they hated religion. They wanted people to be tolerant of religion. But they sort of felt that the only way to sort of move forward was to kind of get away from the teachings of the Bible and move towards more reason and logic. One of the first great Enlightenment thinkers is none other than John Locke, and his belief was that humans are all born free and equal with three natural light, rights, life, liberty, and property. Now, this is probably going to sound a little bit familiar, and I'll get to that in a minute. When we look at those three natural rights of life, liberty, and property, you got to dissect them a little bit. So when people have the right to life, he's saying that people have the right to basically live, and they should be able to live their life however it is that they want to live. So if they want to be a teacher, if they want to be a lawyer, if they want to live, you know, in the United States or they want to live in Russia or whatever it is, they should have the right to live their life the way that they want to live it. People should have the right to liberty. And when we're talking about liberty, we're talking about freedom. So freedom of choice. So like I said, a lot of these Enlightenment thinkers were deists. Um, John Locke was really sort of no different. He basically believed that if people wanted to believe in a God, they absolutely had the right to do so. And that was, again, that was very much your choice, but liberty really has to do with freedom and the freedom to choose how it is that you're going to live your life. So not only do you have the right to live it, but you have the right to choose how it is that you're going to live that life. And then, of course, John Locke also felt that people had the right to property. So whether it's owning your own land, owning your own home, owning your own business, whatever it may be. John Locke's thinkings are really going to influence Thomas Jefferson when he ends up writing the Declaration of Independence, which of course was the document that basically um, kicked off the American Revolution when the colonists decided, hey, we no longer want to be a colony of Great Britain, we want to go ahead and break away. In the Declaration of Independence, he basically says people have the right to life, liberty, and he changes property to the pursuit of happiness. And really what he was saying was, that because, you know, the colonists were under the control of the British, they really had no way of ever being happy and living their own life. And so therefore, the only way they'd be able to do so was to create their own nation, which we know eventually happens because we have the United States of America today. Voltaire is also a very important one. He has this very famous quote saying, I may not agree with a thing you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And really what this has to do with free speech. He has a big influence not just on free speech, but the freedom of religion as well. So I really want to go back to that quote because I really feel that free speech, especially nowadays, has really been under attack. So I may not agree with a thing you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. So really what he's saying is, is that anybody has the right to free speech. We all have the right to our opinions. We all have a right to think and you know, say what we want to feel. Um, a really great example of when Voltaire actually got quoted was back in 2017 when Colin Kaepernick first took the knee during the national anthem. Um, it, it caused quite a stir. I'm sure you guys remember it. I sure do. You know, some people were saying that, you know, what he did was very brave because he was protesting um, racism and specifically police brutality. Some people felt that it was very disrespectful and they were like, you know, 
the military and you're disrespecting them. And so everyone who was sort of new Colin Kaepernick was, was going around asking them questions like, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And one of the people that they actually interviewed about Kaepernick taking the name was Jim Harbaugh, who used to be Colin Kaepernick's head coach under the San Francisco 49ers, but had left to take the head coaching job over at the University of Michigan. And when they asked Jim Harbaugh about Colin Kaepernick taking the knee, he quotes none other than Voltaire. And he basically says, it doesn't really matter what I think of what he's doing. The fact of the matter is, is that under the First Amendment to the Constitution, he has the right to free speech. So he goes, what I think doesn't really matter. And in some ways, he's absolutely right. We all have the right to free speech, and I definitely feel that it's been under attack, um, especially during the last few months. Even Ricky Gervais, who is the original creator of The Office, um, he's done a, a couple hosting gigs with the Golden Globes. He recently came out with an op-ed and was basically like, just because you don't like what somebody says doesn't give you the right to basically take away their jobs or take away their livelihoods. And people have to realize with free speech, even though you have the right to say what it is that you want to say, and even though you have the right to it, um, unfortunately, it doesn't protect consequence. So even though you have the right to say what it is you believe in, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to like it. But do know that free speech is very heavily protected in this country. And when we go into the Bill of Rights later this week, I'll, I'll go over the very few limitations of it. And then, of course, Voltaire wasn't just for free speech, but he was also for freedom of religion as well. So again, whether you wanted to be, you know, a Christian or a Jew or, you know, you're, you're a Muslim or you're an atheist, you're agnostic, or you're a Wiccan, or you're a Buddhist, you know, whatever it is, you have the right to believe and practice in whatever religion that you choose to. Montesquieu, he was a man that believed that power should not be held by one man alone, but separated among several branches, and that power should be a check to power. Now, to understand where this idea comes from, you really have to look at Europe at the time. A lot of European nations are under the rule of monarchy, meaning a royal family. So either a king or a queen was in charge. And the problem with having just one or two people in charge is that if one or two people are in charge, they pretty much can do whatever it is that they want. There's no way to ever check their power. And Montesquieu really saw this as a problem. That if you have one person in charge and they can do whatever they want, that means they can do whatever good they want, which we would probably applaud. But they could also do whatever bad they want, which that could be a very dangerous thing. And so really what he wanted was a government in which there was a checks and balances that existed, meaning that if one branch of the government was getting out of control, there was going to be another branch that would be able to check them. And that's the type of government that we have today. There are three branches in our government. You have the executive branch, that's the presidency the legislative branch, that's Congress, and it's broken up into the House of Representatives and the Senate. The House of Representatives, excuse me, the House of Representatives is based on population. On um, the Senate, every state is giving two, uh, two Senate seats. And then, of course, you have the judicial branch, which is the court system. In this case, it's going to be the Supreme Court. Each branch has the ability to basically check one another. So let's say tomorrow Congress went ahead and decided to pass a bill saying anybody with blonde hair is not allowed to be out by 5 p.m., right? I mean, hearing that, well, it's absolutely ridiculous, but just go with it for the example. The president, so the executive branch, would have the ability to veto that law. To veto it means he doesn't like it, he refuses to sign it, and he says that bill is not going to become a law. Congress would have the ability to override that veto, meaning if they can get two-thirds of Congress, that's 66% of Congress, to approve not allowing blondes outside after 5 p.m., then they can override the president's veto, but the judicial branch basically reviews the law. So they would review a law like that and be like, this is unconstitutional because it's discriminatory. So would that ever become a law? No, but you kind of get the purpose of how the legislative, executive, and judicial branch all check one another. And really it's in places to make sure no one branch gets more power, excuse me, over the others. Rousseau had this belief that man is born free and everywhere he is in change, or chains, excuse me. The sovereignty of the people is essential to the creation of a just government. So really this idea of, you know, power to the people or power of the people really comes from Rousseau. 
he sort of felt that the only way a government was ever really going to be successful, the way that a government was ever going to last, is if the power rested with the people themselves. That people have to be willing to be governed, right? They have to be willing to abide by laws. They have to be willing to, you know, see their government and be like, hey, I'm going to be able to live under this type of government for years to come. And, and so that's why we really see his influence in the Constitution is because the power does indeed rest with the people. You know, we vote every couple of years in elections. Obviously, we have a major election coming up this November. Um, people always kind of focus on the presidency, which is true. You know, obviously, we vote for president every four years. But, of course, within your own states and within your own communities, you're also voting. Um, so there's several different propositions that are going to be up in California this year that we'll be learning about in probably about a month's time. Uh, but you also vote for who's going to be in your Senate seats, who's going to be your representative to represent you in Congress, things like that. So it is very important that you're engaging in what we call your civic duty and you're paying attention and you're taking a part of the process. So that way you can make sure that you form a very just government and a government that's going to work for not just you, but really people in your community as well. If not, according to Rousseau, if government's not by the people and for the people, chances are it's not going to work. Caesar Beccaria, and I'm probably butchering his name, but that's okay, uh, really had this belief that just because you have been accused of a crime does not mean you shouldn't be treated humanely. And this is very key. He, he's really going to influence what we call due process. So when you are accused of a crime, right, you, you are innocent until proven guilty, but you also have the ability to prove your innocence in a court of law. So it's not like we just throw you in jail and then we keep you there for 20 years, and then, okay, well, after 20 years, we decided you're no longer guilty, so that's that, right? That's not how that works. To be given your due process or your right to due process, there are a few things that you get when you're accused of a crime. For one, you get a lawyer, and if you can't afford one, one is provided for you. You get a, a trial and a jury by your peers. So in a jury, you have 12 people. In order for those 12 people to either convict you, or well, just to convict you in general, they all have to come to a unanimous agreement, meaning all 12 would have to agree. If 11 agree that you're guilty and one doesn't, that's what we call a hung jury. Um, the district attorney, who basically prosecutes criminals on behalf of the state, they then have the opportunity where they can go back and retry or they can just say, hey, forget it. And then, um, you know, of course, if all 12 agree that, hey, you're not guilty, then congratulations, you are innocent. Um, some interesting things about how, like, the court system works. You, if you're being accused of a crime, it's on the state to provide what we call the burden of proof, right? It's not on the defense team. Their goal is really just to, to sort of defend and something else that you should know about our criminal justice system, we have what's called a common law system. So it's not about whether or not you did something, it's what it is that you can prove in a court of law. So sometimes people might be guilty, but people can't prove it in a court of law, so they won't necessarily try them. And we see this in our system, you know, you know that some people are completely guilty and they're found innocent, or you know, they're innocent and they're found guilty, or sometimes like you might know that people are guilty of a crime, but they don't necessarily try it in a court of law. You know, it's just how it works. Uh, Bakara also believed that torture should never be used, and he also felt that you should have a speedy trial and your punishment should fit the crime. Right, so if you go and say, I'm sure most kids have done this, right? You're at the grocery store and you're a kid and you stole like a candy bar or something, right? If a five-year-old steals a candy bar, we're not going to go chop off your hand as a result, right? That, that's not how it works, and that's really what Bakara sort of felt, that, you know, if you murdered somebody and you got 25 years to life in prison, that would be a punishment that fits the crime. If you say still $10 from, you know, your local grocery store, you shouldn't get the death penalty for it. So he really was a believer in that. Wollstonecraft, she's one of our few uh, women enlightenment thinkers, and her idea was that if all men are born free, how is it that all women are born slaves? We know that when the Constitution's created, there's that very famous line of, um, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And again, it really is an emphasis on all men, particularly all white men. By the time the Declaration of Independence and both the Constitution are created, we know that slavery is definitely in place in the United States. And of course, women as well don't really have equal rights. 
Abigail Adams, who was the wife to John Adams, who becomes the second president of the United States. He was also a huge influence in creating the Constitution. She kept telling him, don't forget about the women, don't forget about the women. Um, but unfortunately, this idea that women were equal to men didn't really exist at that time. At the time that the Constitution was created, pretty much all white men had the right to vote. Um, all men will have the right to vote after the Civil War, so you're looking at about the year 1870, and all women won't receive the right to vote until 1920. Um, but Wollstonecraft was very well aware of the fact that women weren't treated equally, um, you know, they couldn't inherit property, nor could they really own property, that women were really in that stereotypical role of they were expected to stay home, cook, clean, take care of the kids, and she definitely sought something more and better for them. And then Adam Smith is our last Enlightenment thinker. He really has to do with the economy. And Smith's belief was that if humans freely follow their own self-interests, government will be guided by an invisible hand. And he called this laissez-faire. So laissez-faire is a style of government that basically literally translates to hands-off. And so what Adam